So now we're moving on to sort of the next step in trying to understand the whole brain from a computational perspective. So Petra came at this from, let's say, uh, a mean field perspective, if you want. Like this is a whole brain, it's a virtual brain. But the level of modeling, as you saw, is relatively abstract, right? And now we're going to shift gears a little bit. That's with Fred. Uh, so Fred Hamker, I know Fred already for a long time. Um, and Fred has been very active in, in computational neuroscience, um, but then also looking really more at how we can think about specific brain structures for more, let's, uh, taking into account the more specific and detailed organization of these structures, right? So I think it's a very good counterpoint to the kind of ambitious project that Petra is advancing, which raises this very fundamental question of yeah, when is a model good enough, right? So should it be like the perfect model that includes all the details we know about? Or can we abstract to some computational principles? And I think Fred takes a perspective where you also bring in more of the anatomy and the physiological data that we have. So this is fantastic work. Fred, it's great that you're here. And I'm looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you very much, Paul, for your introduction. So I also start with a start with a kind of ambitious vision, but then I restrict myself to particular potential brain functions and models. So, well, uh, we have a long title, but let's stick to that one, a neurocomputational approach towards cognition. And a while ago, I thought about, well, what, what may be cognition? Huh? And where well, you have some sensory input, internal states and motor response. This is kind of well, input, output ma mapping, action perception, or however you want to call that. And maybe a first, idea what cognition may be is that a kind of device has some capabilities of changing its own internal states that it doesn't have purely rely on some inputs um, while well, you could also then have some errors back that for example also the sensory input is not given so that the system for example um, searches or or looks for its own sensory input it requires and all these things so then I looked up a few models um, because I thought, okay, what, what do we all have? What, what is cognition? What have people thought about that? It's probably not complete, but that is what, what I kind of found. We have these kind of cognitive appro cognitivist uh, approaches, but they are more like classical AI versions from that. Act R, SOA, Clarion, and these models, uh, they have particular production rules and so on. They are not very neural-like, although there are some neural networks in some of those. Um, well, some people have said, well, there's these inactive emergent systems. You just have a neural network and something emerges from that. But in the end, I didn't find a very sophisticated example I could add there. Um, so it's a little bit vague uh, how this may wake, work. Uh, then we have uh, deep learning, model-free, model-based things. But are these yet already approaches to cognition? Maybe not. They are st maybe probably still a level before. Um, because they rather do this input-output mapping, they hardly change their own internal states. But there's some work goes or going into this direction as well on this level. Um, yeah, and then we have, uh, let's say, call them brain-like agent. Um, Darwin, maybe one very old version of that, and Spawn, a little bit uh, a newer one. And actually, Chris Elias Smith, who came up with Spawn, um, well, hit, hit the point, um, also compared to the talk before. Um, in his article, he mentioned, well, we have large-scale systems model of the brain, but they hardly do anything. So his point was, well, when we better understand the brain, these models should be able to actually solve some, some tasks. And this is also kind of my research agenda, since I'm a trained engineer. Um, I would like to see the progress in neuroscience and understanding the brain also be visible in the sense that we are able to somewhat develop a brain like AI. And in, if we are not doing this, if we are not able to show this, 
I think we have yet not understood how the brain works. So let's go into that direction. Um, this is a little slide of Spawn. I first edit, I don't talk too much on this, but it was somewhat the idea to build up a systems level with some components on this and they showed that this model can actually do uh, some kind of tasks. And this is a little movie on a, on accounting tasks. You, you can pr present some model some form of sensory input. Oops, a lot. Does it start now? Hmm. I'm wondering now why this It's a little bit unclear what happens now. Yeah, it, it doesn't start. I don't know why. Uh, I think I, that's the next slide. Maybe it's not so important. It was just a little demonstration. Hopefully, hopefully my movies in the end will work. Um, so I skip that movie. But it shows that uh, you can present uh, the kind of um, mathematical tasks. 3 plus 4 I think was a task and then the model has some capabilities to initially sense these little uh, numbers and then it has some control architecture to combine them and to count them up to 7 and then actually has a device to write the 7 as an output. Uh, so it's a complete perception action one but it's, it was all pre-programmed. It's a neural network, indeed a spiking neural network behind that, but it didn't learn these tasks. So it was pre-programmed to actually do this task. And the question is now when we want that these models can actually learn something, what, what is learning? Of course we know synaptic plasticity almost everywhere in the brain, but are there particular parts of the brain that are probably do more learning than other parts so th that are very important for example for learning behavior for example and this brings me now to the basal ganglia i don't know how much background you have in the basal ganglia so i have now a few slides to add some knowledge or build up some knowledge here so it's a subcortical structure but it's heavily interconnected with the cortex and you see it here it has a few nuclei, the caudate nucleus, the putamen, they all build up the striatum and the striatum is the input structure of the um, basal ganglia and then it has the substantia nigra, the globus pallidus, internal and external part um, and the GPI, so the in, uh, internal part projects then towards the thalamus and the thalamus then back to the cortex. And what is what makes that basal ganglia also important is its heavy input from dopaminergic cells. Um, of course, dopamine cells uh, also project to other parts of the brain, prefrontal areas. Uh, this is underestimating this, so there's also other dopaminergic connections uh, towards the cortex. Maybe not very early sensory ones, but of course, most of cortex uh, receives dopamine but even more prefrontal areas and even way more for example the basal ganglia. So the idea about the dopamine system is um, that it modulates signal transition and it could determine the periods of learning. When do we actually want to learn something? So there's these classical studies from Wolfgang Schulz and many other researchers who recorded from these dopamine neurons here in the ventral uh, tegmental area and they observed when you present a um, kind of rewarding stimulus these dopaminergic cells fire. So you could say oh, okay they indicate reward but then they figured out probably not. Um, for example if you present a reward predicting stimulus um, the dopamine cells start to fire 
after the presentation of that reward predicting stimulus uh, and not anymore on the reward. So you always compare it. So you present the reward predicting stimulus and then the reward. No, it's a kind of um, um, what, what's it work for that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the prediction, but uh, when you present it, this association um, conditioning. No? Yeah, yeah, I asked you because you worked on that. <laughs> um, yeah, but then you could do the following. Uh, you present a conditioning stimulus and then omit the reward. And what you then see um, often that there is a dip. So, and that brought the theorists uh, to propose that it's probably a reward prediction error the dopamine cells may encode. So they are usually silent when everything is fine, but always indicate something when the model of the world of the brain is wrong. Either you are surprised, oh, there is a reward, I didn't expect that, or in the sense that, what well, I expected a reward, but it's not there. Because these are maybe critical things when indeed you should learn. Because that is the occasion when your model fails. So, Basil Ganga has been often reported to be linked with motor things, decision making for motor selection or motor preparation. But indeed, there's many, many, many other cortex basal ganglia loops. And this is just a very broad scaling from motor, oculomotor, dorsal lateral prefrontal, lateral orbitotal, and anterior cingulate, or you could say more. Mm, goal or emotional, um, limbic, to more cognitive control, to more motor things. So it's all over these loops. And how does a typical loop look like? This is shown in this figure. We start here in um, some cortical area. Here it's motor or premotor cortex. Then um, we have a glutamatergic protection into the neurons of the uh, putamen, um, but in general it's a striatum as the input structure, but I told you that's, that's at least two nuclei. And from there on you we have two pathways. We have a D1 mediated pathway and this is inhibitory. So um, that means uh, the cells here I, tell you in a minute a little bit about this D1, D2, what this means, um, but let's take it for now. Projects in an inhibitory sense to the neurons in the GPI and they inhibit neurons in the thalamus. So these neurons are tonically active, so they are constantly inhibiting the thalamus. So what that pathway is doing, it removes that inhibition of the thalamus because now the, if these neurons get active, they inhibit the tonic activation in the GPI, reduce it, and therefore remove the activate or the remove the inhibition from the neurons in the thalamus. So they can somewhat activate indirectly thalamic neurons by removing the inhibition. And this could maybe then trigger some cortex thalamic interactions. This pathway has a D2 pathway, has an inhibition and another inhibition. That means if you count that also up to this, it can excite or activate these neurons to rather stop um, a process in that sense that it further increases the inhibition of the thalamic neurons. So it rather blocks something. That is why this pathway is often called a kind of no go pathway whereas this has been often called a go pathway. Well, and then we have um, the so-called hyperdirect pathway. It has some, some flavors. We have a kind of glutamatergic projection from the subthalamic nucleus directly on the GPI. That means also they activate the neurons. It's also kind of blocking or stopping behavior. Um, and the indirect pathway can, could come up in, in, in that short version or in that long version, but the effect on the output is similar. So that's the main 
connectivity. We know now that these kind of connections are not that clean as this figure looks like, but people didn't come up with much better ideas than this yet. Um, there's also some crosstalk within the nuclei, but also that crosstalk is not yet clear what it may do or may not do. So that is of course simplified, but that is um, presently, well, the best conceptual um, explanation what we have from the basal ganglia. Um, so what about these open and closed loops? Um, so I open loops go from one part of cortex to another part of cortex and closed loop go from one part of cortex back to the same part of cortex. May it have some functional concept. So we published a while ago a little article where we thought about this and maybe these uh, kind of closed loops um, have the ability to keep something in a particular state, for example a working memory state. Um, and the point is often people talk about working memory but it's not given for free. You have to have some structures that activate the circuit in that sense when you actually need the memory, it must be task dependent and also shut them off again, clear the working memory. And often people just talk about some reverberating activation and then they say, ah, that's working memory. But this is just the content, what, but what we need is we need, we need a controlling of this content. Um, and the other part is uh, the open loops and open loops could be maybe relevant for attention. For example, when you want to, in some situation, create some top-down signals or so am I looking now for a particular pointer, a car or a person? These kind of activation pointers must come from somewhere. And why not maybe being controlled or activated by basal ganglia circuits? Well, you could say, yeah, prefrontal door cortex is all doing this. But how could prefrontal cortex learn all this? And I come later back to this point. So let's first start with working memory. Um, I just focus on a single working memory task and that is a more, uh, yeah, a little bit extreme task. The task here is um, to have a one, a two AX task. So the task is you show one, press left button, show an A, press left button, and then an X, right button. So when the sequence of one AX occurs, you press the right button. Otherwise, always left. But you can have some intervening stimuli. You can have one Y, A, X, and so on. That is also valid. Um, or you have a one and a two, but then it should be cleared. You are then in a different context. So then the two context starts and you can forget the one. So this task requires control of working memory. It has to, when the one occurs, put the one into memory. But when a two occurs without that sequence ending, you throw the one out again because it's over. The two is now the context. And similarly with the A and Y and so on. So it's a quite complicated task and if you don't instruct humans how that thing works, I think they can learn for, for days to learn this task. Um, here of course you have a little, little bit of structure that you have a one and a two and here letters that gives already some hints. Um, so you have multiple loops, uh, an outer loop, one, two, and one to four inner loops. And then with a certain probability these loops occur and um, have target sequences. So what could be a simple model of the basal ganglia learning this? And we thought, okay, maybe we should have a kind of two loop model. One model, one loop that actually is doing the decision whether a left or right button has to be pressed. And another loop that has the capability of keeping items in memory. Because if you don't have it, you are anyway lost on that task. And that loop should indeed fully learn the task. So we thought, okay, we need some prefrontal structure that informs 
the small motor or pre-motor loop, let's say, uh, about items that are in memory. And we have, again, also a kind of um, present visual input um, that's here. And we have this loop that can actually store previous items by a closed loop activation. Of course, you could debate, well, maybe this loop may be, may be sufficient. Um, and this is just used for training, maybe. We are thinking about these versions as well. But in this model, we had a full closed loop activation of cortex, basal ganglia, salamus, back to cortex that can indeed store items by learning that. So, uh, some details about the architecture. So, here we have um, multiple or two independent prefrontal loops. They sit in parallel and see the same thing as a visual input. Um, and loops are not yeah, predetermined to present particular stimuli. They just see everything and then decide on themselves how they want to change their connectivity in order to store them. Um, yeah, for learning, um, we, we had a kind of instrumental procedure. We can add new loops when a huge dip in the SNC neurons occur. So when a huge dip in the dopamine neurons occurs. So I mentioned dips in dopamine occur when the prediction is much different than the actual reward. And we took this as an indication when the model is going wrong. And when the model is going heavily wrong, it should actually recruit new source resources uh, to made, made, made available in order to solve a certain task. So you don't penalize the circuit that made the error. Um, we do this as well. Uh, I show this later. But when when a huge dip occurs, that is an indication that it's not a minor error anymore. Then we add new resources. Um, yeah. Okay. In the end, we have a probabilistic selection of the act based on the activity in the motor cortex for a decision. So we take the motor cortex activation and when it's very strong it's a clear response when it's rather weaker we have some probabilistic rules um, to then choose um, an action in order to induce introduce a little bit more noise at that level we have synapse specific calcium traces that becomes important because um, there is there's some research being done on the same task from, Ren, from Randall O'Reilly. I don't know if you know that work. Um, he actually had a model where he just tried out things. He said, okay, one stimulus, well, let's throw that stimulus in working memory and then try it out. Um, I thought that's a little bit dumb because um, here you try out all possible alternatives until you find the right one. Um, we didn't want to do this. We uh, thus induced um, synapse-specific calcium traces, meaning it's a kind of eligibility trace. Uh, people from reinforcement learning know this. Um, you have a little local memory about events that happened in the past, and then when they turn out, when they correlate with some kind of reward, it's either you use it to increase that evidence or decrease this. Uh, what this is what Paul somewhat meant that this local um, yeah, um, support of, of, of some kind of decision or uh, reduction. Um, so we have Habian and three-factor learning in the model. We have some kind of metaplasticity, some adaptive learning parameters, uh, but nothing very fancy. Um, and the LTD, long-term depression, in prefrontal loops is a little bit slower than in the motor loop. So when there's an error, it could be either in the motor loop or in the um, prefrontal loop, in the more memory thing. Um, and we thought, OK, let's keep the motor loop more active, flexible, rather than the prefrontal loop, and then have this kind of search gradient. So I often said something about neurons and modeling.
Um, here we use simple rate-coded neurons that can be described by a ordinary differential equation. We also have spiking models of the basal ganglia, but this work has been done with uh, rate-coded neurons. So here you have um, the change of the membrane potential on the left-hand side. Well, this is a decay parameter. We have the simple um, presynaptic activation that is weighted by, by the other inputs and uh, a little noise ter term and a kind of uh, threshold. And then you have an output function. This is a simple nonlinearity um, to avoid negative values in the output. So they are rather zero or some positive activation. And that, of course, changes with each time step. Uh, the temporal resolution is um, one tenth of a millisecond. Um, yeah, then we need this calcium specific um, eligibility traces. They simply look for the Hebbian uh, kind of, uh, um, yeah, they store Hebbian um, um, joint firing patterns. So they look at the uh, uh, post and the pre activation, and whenever post and pre is there, you have that trace. And later you use that trace for a weight change by uh, uh, multiplying the trace with a dying kind of dopaminergic signal. And that is actually the reward prediction error signal I mentioned. So you take the reward prediction area, uh, error, error signal and multiply this with the trace and has here some kind of um, OUYA way app learning um, rule. are in some sense your short-term memory yeah. to bridge this gap between yeah. stimuli to which you want to respond and then the reward signal. Exactly. So, but that would mean you, you have to maintain quite a different set of things, right? Because a priori you don't necessarily know what time constant you want or what intervals you want to call. Yeah, there's the interval at the level of the presentation of the stimuli. It's um, um, let's see here, uh, this is, you need to have traces that somewhat capture these, these time intervals here. No? Grossberg had this spectral timing idea for the yeah. cerebellum. Yeah. You have a whole bunch of synapses, you all tuned to a different interval, and you pick the guy that matches. So would you do something similar here, or you don't need that? Um, or it's a prior? That you we predefined uh, the time constant of that. No? Um, of course, when you have very long range dependencies, you cannot capture those. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't want to say that, that this is all, but what, uh, what I'm saying, you need something like this, and we had a, a simple version of that. No, but just that we know where. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. So I told you already that, that one to air stars is heavily complex, and, um, I think also for that model um, to learn. But we thought, OK, why shouldn't we use some kind of shaping procedure to start up learning this? So then there's some form of incremental learning. So we said, OK, let's first learn a one and a response. So one right, two left, for example. And just ask the model to learn this. And then we introduce a gap. So we don't respond immediately on the one, we wait. And we wait that long that the activity declined. So that means the model has already, has to learn to memorize the one and then respond. Or memorize the two and then respond. And if we actually can do that, maybe we can add some things on top. So this is how we start it. And actually, um, this is not a fully correct response here, no? but it's just one response to force a model to keep that stimuli in memory. So we start with that first shaping, and then we increase the complexity, do a 1A and then the right button, or 2B and the right button. This, again, here we have this. A in between, no, but the 2B is also right button, otherwise left buttons. And then we have the full task. And by doing this, the model incrementally learned that complex 
task. Although the initial parts could be wrong, but it later corrected itself on that. So I show, show you how it um, looks like just on the, on the first version of that with the one and memory and two and memory. So we, here we have the uh, in um, IT cortex where we say, okay, this is uh, number activation and it learns uh, IT to PFC connections. That's why they start building up from early trials to later trials. Here we are six to uh, four to eight. Here we are um, above 100 and this is kind of in between. So this builds up, but you see immediately when we remove the visual input, the activation goes down again. So initially it has no memory, but if you go later to trial 70, you see that there's some remaining activation there. And if you are above 100 trials, you see that the model has learned that memory. Um, how did it learn that memory? Initially the striatal neurons are simply inactive. They don't know. No, they they don't know what to do. They just have their traces, but they don't have a, they are not tuned to anything particular. So they are dumb initially. Um, but later on, they become selective for particular numbers. And that go pathway removes the inhibition and could therefore store these items in memory. I'll show you later how it works actually. And this is also seen in the GPI is initially tonically active. And later on, you see this kind of deactivation. That means the GPI neurons become inactive and therefore open that loop that allows to store an item in memory and keep it open for a while. But then, of course, when a new stimulus comes in, that model has to be able to learn whether a stimulus has to be removed or has to be kept in memory. And it's doing that. So it learns the structure of that task. So this is how it looks like. Um, here we have one particular item already in memory, but indicated by that red um, activation. And here we show a new stimulus, that blue one. Mm -hmm. And um, here, so this one, two again. So the one is in memory, the two arrives. So the, the model has learned to erase the one and store the two. And it looks like this. The one is in memory. You present the two. Initially, the STN neurons became selective once an A is stored and a two is shown. So they learned this combined rules. One is in, two is shown. Then send an erase signal to the GPI. So the STN is further activating GPI neurons and therefore removing all the low activation in the, in the, in the loop. So it's somewhat throwing stimuli out. Um, this is cleaned up by the SCN GPE connection. And then the direct pathway can induce the new pattern, the new number in that circuit. And that is then kept in memory. The motor loop is very simple. It just gets input from the actual input from all the memory circuits uh, activation here and just brings it all together and decides what button to press. Um, so what can we indeed show? Um, the model can learn this task. And then we said, OK. Um, can we show something additional? So we did a relearning ex experiment. So we go back to the first step of shaping. And the first step of shaping is a little bit lift different rule than the, than the final rule. Well, there's some nice changes there. Or we do a generalization. We said, OK, instead of 1A to B, we switch it now for 1B to A. So we changed the logic. So these are the steps of shaping. I said we learned the one to a extras in these three steps. The first took 160 trials. The second, roughly 300 trials. And the um, third, roughly uh, 250 trials. So not many trials compared to the O'Reilly models. It's 
No? Nothing. O'Reilly model did thousands of trials learning this task. Of chaos, we did it differently. We had this shaping procedure, but it's fairly quick. Um, and then we do the relearning task. We go back to the first step of shading, and we see that even that, the model has kept some knowledge. We just need a few trials to do the first step of the shaping. Although it's different, but it captured some knowledge. It's must, much faster than learning the first step from scratch. Or the generalization is when we change the rules, we are also much faster than any learning of the, in, the, in, the, in the first steps of learning. OK, that was uh, the working memory. I now continue with basal ganglia, but in a different domain. Maybe if. Well, one question yeah. I hear, Fred, is that an important aspect of basal ganglia, if you, if you look, if you hit the stratum, is of course you have a very strong competitive interaction among the medium spiny cells. Right? And, um, you don't really include that here, is my impression. <coughs> or um, not, not in an explicit way. No, yeah, it's. I don't know if it's so competitive. I mean, well, people people rather said that um, the competition is not that strong that that they heavily suppress each other. No? So the, of course, we don't know all the interneurons yet, but it's surprisingly low competitive. I would rather say right. there is competition, but it's not like the winner takes all there. No? No. It's like modulating. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And what's yeah. interesting is, of course, how do you think it would affect the dynamics of this model if you would have, let's say, this sort of soft winner take all kind of interaction now across your channels? Because yeah. in the end, you deal with, with rather small differences in input levels. Yeah, yeah you, you definitely, so we have competition in there, and you need it because it's a learning architecture. Um, if you have no competition in the, at the postsynaptic level, you cannot learn something useful. You just can learn a very small code book um, because these neurons have to compete in order to specialize on particular patterns. Otherwise, they roughly learn the same. So for decorrelation. Yeah, definitely. Otherwise, you, you can't do very sophisticated learning. And also huh? by virtue of that, that you get like in this OER kind of uh, orthogonalization. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. But here we have nonlinear neurons. Oh, yeah, I had linear ones. No, no of course. Yeah. OK, further questions? OK, then I continue now with category learning. And um, I told you already that there's multiple cortex basal ganglia loops. And this is a um, figure from uh, Carol Seeger and Earl Miller, who uh, published something on category learning in the brain. and. Um, of course, Miller is, did a lot of work on this with prefrontal cortex and all these things. And they also mentioned a kind of visual loop and um, executive loop. And I would like to tap into this. But first, I explain you the, the task uh, they had the, that they showed uh, the monkeys. And they recorded simultaneously in prefrontal cortex and in the stratum. So the task goes like this. Uh, monkeys had to fixate. Then they will see a cue. And the queue is a category. It's constructed from two proto images. And they simply shifted a few of those dots to generate an arbitrary number of stimuli of category A and B. Of course, you can make it more or less easy um, by the similarity of these and by the algorithm how much you shift uh, dots around. Um, and then the monkeys, after a delay, had to respond here by a saccade instead of a button press. And what they did, they started with uh, just a few stimuli, kept some of them, the familiar ones, but added always an increasingly large number of novel stimuli. And they looked at the response to the novel stimuli in order to see in how far they generalize. Because category learning is about generalization. It should not just show that you can store already seen images. No? You should rather abstract from 
the ones you have seen to the new ones. So the monkeys could do that task. Um, that is a little bit complicated figure. They had eight blocks. I showed you this. And here they compressed the eight blocks into three phases. Phase one, phase two, and three. Um, so within this one, two, three phases, we have, of course, here blocks one, two, three, eight. Huh? So they start from 50% correct. That's natural because only two stimuli. And then somewhat increase the behavior with increasing number of trials. Um, and here we have always 15 trials in that block, but there's some hidden trials here in that phases, uh, but they somewhat reach a performance close to 100% in the end. So they can do the generalization task. So these are z-scores now of in how far the neurons in the prefrontal cortex and the striatum predict the decision of the monkey. Um, and um, red means high confidence and then uh, blue low confidence. And here we have the time scale of from the Q, delay and saccade period. So they looked at in how far these neurons maybe also change their prediction um, or their category indication um, during the, the, the trial. And for us it's mainly important to look at the Q period because we didn't model everything, uh, we didn't model the saccade, we also here omitted the memory period because here also the delay was one second, you need a memory. So we, since we were just more interested in the category learning itself, we were interested in the, in the Q period. And what you see is initially, well, when you show the Q, in the first phase of learning, the prefrontal cortex neurons have no good idea about the category that is shown. But during learning, they get a better idea and then they indicate the correct category. Um, that's not surprising. A little bit surprising is that although the basal ganglia quickly learns the task, so the striatal neurons become quickly category selective. They are not during later trials. That is a little bit strange to understand. Well, the overall idea was from, from Miller that the basal ganglia could teach the prefrontal cortex about the category membership. Well, okay, you could say, ah, they, they, they learn fast, they learn slow, why? Why not? But still, it's a little bit surprising to assume, well, why should they go out of the game? Why should they do that? Um, or do they even go out of the game? So we wanted to address these questions. First of all, how could basal ganglia learn? Uh, how could basal ganglia teach prefrontal cortex uh, to become category selective? And why do the straightal neurons get somewhat kicked out during later phases of learning or do they really kick, get kicked out? So we had already a... Yeah? Before, before we explain it with your model, uh -huh. is, it, is it fair to call these categories? Because in the end we have this different distributions of dots and we say if the dot distribution is sort of in, in one quadrant, I call it the category. Isn't it a bit of an overinterpretation? I mean, the category would imply that there's a very strong top-down component that really imposes a category boundary. Right? So, do they show that they have anything like these very like category boundaries if you use this kind of stimuli? I would doubt that. Um, I don't know if it matters. So I'm, I'm not sure whether well, uh, Miller did it really in this task, but we, he had shown uh, in, in previous tasks, this category boundary with this cats, dogs, and these morphs in between, and the order recorded. Yeah, um, I, I think in this article he didn't show the boundaries. Um, it's, it's mainly about generalization. Of course, you could argue are these clean categories or not. It's a called prototype distortion task, which is a valid uh, 
at least in the literature, uh, um, accepted task for category learning. Jochen, what, what, would you call this a, a visual category? These stimuli? Well, I'm generous, you know. <laughs> no, but if I say it is a class, now you would give me the same answer, right? Then your generosity gets us in trouble because now it's both a class and a category. So I think we got to choose, Professor. Um, maybe you could explain for everybody what the distinction between class and category. Well, the class, a class you would define in a pure feed-forward way in terms of the statistical properties of your stimulus, right? If if, if these statistics in some way align, like there's a co-occurrence of dots in a certain quadrant of the stimulus defined in a purely feed forward stimulus st stimulus bound way you would call this as a class right so that means there's you don't need any kind of intrinsic prior information in the classifier that that does the recognition to make this separation right? but now if you talk about cats and dogs for instance right we, in that sense there's there's a, there's a very strong prior in the system that imposes a distinction between these stimuli even if it's not that manifest in the feature properties of the stimuli themselves, right? So yeah, but part of, I mean, even cats and dogs, I don't know if the monkeys that were raised in, 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 in caves mm -hmm. um, uh, have a knowledge of cats and dogs. So but maybe for them, it's also just a visual stimulus. But we don't know, yeah. Of course, categories could be like category ball. Mm -hmm. A good ball is not just a visual stimulus can play with a ball, it should sure. not jump, uh, mm -hmm. I could, should be able to throw it to you mm -hmm. and all these things. Of, of course, this is, uh, I think, a much more comprehensive mm -hmm. content of categories. Mm -hmm. No, but look, Let's, it's, it's a little bit too far for my work. The important thing is here, it's a used wording, mm -hmm. I just took it over, they called it category learning, but of course one could debate whether this is a really strong view of category learning. No, it's just a visual distinction, maybe a class. No, but what triggered it was the conclusion, right? Because they say, oh, surprise, surprise. It's a prefrontal that sort of is be a better predictor later in learning than this. And now you, people might, then you might lead to the, to the conclusion to say, ah, so prefrontal does category learning. Yeah. Right? And, I, and now we right. have an issue. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's just for that reason, yeah. okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're free. Okay. Good. So we took um, a model of the basal ganglia. Um, it's a kind of um, little bit revised version of that model we had before, which did the um, uh, working memory learning task. Here we have now uh, all three pathways included and so on. I don't go too into too much detail, but we showed with some of this work that the indirect pathway well, let's, let's put it that way. Um, I forgot one thing to do. So what we want to show here is that this is a learning architecture. You see the dopamine entering um, nuclei in the basal ganglia, but not entering the PFC. So our claim was, is it sufficient that the task knowledge transmitted via the dopamine signal can actually learn, now I say again, category selective connectivities from IT, from a visual, to a kind of class or category representation. Um, so PFC doesn't get an error signal. The implicit error signal is in the DA, and the output of the basal ganglia informs the PFC via this cortex thalamic loop about the decisions. And is it sufficient? Could this basal ganglia loop here, train this cortex, cortex cortical connection. And this would be an example that basal ganglia might train cortex cortical, cortocortical connections because you might, might want to ask, okay, why is cortex clever? How does it knowledge get into cortex? And maybe parts of that knowledge is transferred by the basal ganglia. And this is what we wanted to show. Uh, you had a question? I figured it out. OK. We connect the plastic brain artery. Yeah. OK. Um, 
Yeah, so these are green, are adaptive, these are fixed. Um, and there's lots of adaptivity and we train all the connections simultaneously. No incremental way. Okay, that's mainly it, I guess. Ah, yeah, okay. And what is also important that we think that the indirect pathway has a capability. Once this circuit is established, you, 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 it's quite strong. And the indirect pathway can nevertheless change that by blocking that pathway. So this is how the model behaves. It also st st can learn the task close to 90% over the blocks. And this is again the reference to the added exemplar. So you add more and more stimuli in these blocks. And that is now a movie. Uh, hopefully it works now. Yeah, it looks like it works. Um, so this shows uh, weight connections towards the striatum and here towards the PFC. And you see the, these are very fast and adaptive, these are very slow. So the idea is that um, Basil Ganga is a fast learner, it picks up the activation profile and stores them into the connectivity and then trains a slow learning cortical architecture. And that's why they develop closely over time and represent kind of pattern of the dots, no? Where these ones are very adaptive and never show, show a f full complete category. And that is important later as well. And then a single trial goes like this. That was a very fast run on the connectivities. And a single trial goes like, huh? why that now? So this is now a single trial, we present a stimulus no? and then it leads to an activation in the stratum, in the PFC and then that uh, activation then determines via the salamos uh, what kind of uh, category is selected. No? So it has full temporal dynamics of a single trial. So. Let's look now at the statistics of the model. So we did the same, but we just um, limit ourselves on that early Q presentation period because we don't have the memory in the model. So what do you see? Um, stratum, very fast. So it's D prime um, here. It's a little bit earlier. You have to add one more to the Z score, but it will lead to a similar output. Um, so that means, uh, yeah, straight on neurons indicate category membership, but they will lose it also in the model. PFC slowly develops a category response. And that is indeed uh, very similar to the monkey data. Why do we see this in the model? So I show you now three cells. So this is a cell in one cell in the striatum. We just skimmed through the cells. How do they look like? And it's always a trial one. You, you have multiple trials here over the eight blocks. And we sh this neuron mainly likes stimuli that belong to category A. It learns them very fast, but then as we add more and more, it becomes a little bit uncertain. So it doesn't respond to all stimuli of category A. It misses some, but it's somewhat clean because it never responds to category B stimuli. That neuron also develops a preference for A, but that drops now towards category B. But on or even on B, it's not perfect. So it misses many of those and even responds to a few A. So it's not so clean, that neuron. Um, that neuron um, also has a little bit preference to B, but then, well, it kind of likes both, no? but not all of them. A few on A, a few on on B. So that already indicates, well, these striatal neurons never become heavily tuned to a single category. Even when they are, they miss a few exemplars. So when we look at all neurons and plot them on a scale of uh, stimulus selectivity and category selectivity. So that means here on the right hand side, 
a neuron is fully stimulus selective, so it responds to a particular stimulus and not to any others. And when it's here on the top left, it's mainly category selective, so it likes all the stimuli of a single category. And then we uh, have the straighter neuron in green and the PFC neurons in red. And you see that over the blocks here now, here's block 8, all these PFC neurons are somewhat here in these upper quadrants. That means they are, are very category selective and rather not stimulus selective, because they can't, because stimulus selective means selective for a particular stimulus. Whereas the straighter neurons somewhat are along this diagonal. They, they are a few are indeed category selective, but many of those rather have a preference towards stimuli, somewhat mixed. Then we somewhat change the task. In the task of Miller, he started with a few exemplars and then increasingly added more. We, we now said, okay, let's throw all the exemplars we have on the model and see what happens then. And under this regime, the striatum never becomes category selective. So that indicates that it rather, it never becomes category selective, it rather learns the few stimuli, auswendig is a German word, let's think about, uh, by what? By heart, yeah. Huh? So it rather captures those few stimuli, but when we have more and more stimuli, it cannot cope with this strong wave of different stimuli. That is our conclusion on that. Um, and then we did some analysis and compared it to neural data, and that was indeed a new prediction we did. That was not, this analysis was not done by uh, Anthopoulos and Miller, and we later asked them to do the same analysis on their data, and that is what I'm showing to you. So we have here the equation of the D prime, so that is the mean activation of the preferred category minus the one of the non-preferred activity. And here we have also the variance of the, of the firing in that equation. And we computed for each neuron these uh, parameters and then plotted them here. And plotted them across the different phases. And what we see is that the um, activation of the neurons drops with increasing learning for the preferred one and well, increases a little bit for the non-preferred one. And here the variability in particular increases for the preferred one heavily. And actually we find a very similar pattern in the data. And that model was never fitted to the data. It was just learned on the task. So it's a really true prediction no parameter tuning to make that model more closer to the data. So then we thought, okay, um, it learned dots. Now, um, Paul, now we use faces, uh, but still purely visual. Um, so we thought, okay, let's train the model with uh, Bush, Bush and Clinton faces um, to show that it can actually also deal with with more natural images, but of course it's a simple IT to PFC projection, so of course it cannot generalize all the different poses of faces. These faces were taken from YouTube movies. Um, of course what we have to do, we need some pre-processing. So what we actually did, we, did, we did, took a deep network, learned it on all faces except of Bush and Clinton, and then use this as a pre-processing tool. And then we had a 100-dimensional feature vector in IT, a kind of abstract face representation, and took that vector as IT and projected it to PFC. And then could the basal ganglia also deal with that 100-dimensional abstract feature vector? And um, yeah, it could learn that task. So the red curve is the full model. It also learned to distinguish between Bush and Clinton faces. And then we did a little experiment and um, removed the PFC. Just used the basal ganglia model to 
learn the task. And what you see is that the basal ganglia alone cannot do the task equally well. It has a performance of roughly 85%. That means the teacher, the basal ganglia is a teacher because it receives the dopaminergic input. The teacher is quite poor, but nevertheless the full model can learn the task. So the slow PFC circuit doesn't mind if sometimes the BG is wrong. It can no? so this combination of fast and slow learner is maybe an important key here. So if we have time, I could switch now to the third topic I have. Is there time for that? Yeah. Okay, that brings me now to kind of hierarchical decisions. People often talk about, okay, maybe there's some hierarchy in the organization of tasks and so on. And indeed, there's some anatomical evidence that there's kind of looping architecture from limbic to more cognitive to more premotor and motor loops. Um, but how could it work was now our idea. And how could habitual behavior, for example, emerge? People thought about, well, you have parallel circuits and then they compete in one way and then a kind of habitual circuit takes over. This is somewhat the state of the art. People think about that, but it didn't really match with, with experimental data very well. Although there was some initial hype on that architecture that has declined. And we tried to come up with a new idea. We think there's some kind of multiple loop architecture, always cortex, by the ganglia thalamus back to cortex. But uh, there's a hierarchy in that sense that this loop projects into that next one via a corte uh, cortex stratal projection and so on. And it doesn't have to be linear. It could also be a kind of network-like loops. And furthermore, we also broke up the idea of the dopaminergic signal as a pure reward prediction error signal. What we say is that each of these loops inc computes its own prediction error signal. The limbic loop might deal with a reward prediction error signal, but a motor loop might rather deal with a kind of reaching error signal. And there's some evidence that not all these DA neurons simply compute a reward prediction error. It's maybe in the ventral tegmental area, yeah, but in other dopaminergic parts, maybe even not. Um, but that's an open issue. It's a, it's a strong claim we are making, but I think um, it has a justification because if you have this looping architecture of, let's say, 10, 15 loops, anywhere in this loop an error could happen. And if you just have a single error signal, a reward prediction error, you are lost. You can never train that such a circuit. So you need more specific area, uh, error signals. But are you, are you suggesting that you don't have, uh, if you want, very specific dopaminergic receptor labels for each circuit? Because you seem to say DA1, DA2, DAN. Yeah. So you, you, you're saying you, have, you would also have a specific receptor label? Or is this a specific no, dopaminergic receptor. circuit? It, 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 it's always the same type of circuits, but they, with different inputs. Uh, okay, sorry. Huh? I thought you were. So each loop it has its yeah. own input it deals with, okay. and therefore can also yeah. compute different. No, I thought you were talking D1, D2, D1. No, 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 no. uh, so I was confused, sorry. No, no. Okay, so we. So, uh, yeah, that's somewhat redundant. Um, that we said, okay, three novel key concept. Let me see. Um, yeah, we move from the have the hierarchy. I told this already. Um, yeah, and also the second one is maybe too much text. Sorry. Uh, the the second one says um, we actually learn on the output and not on the initial activation. That has some important consequences. Um, so let's rather do that little animation here. So what are, for example, hierarchical decisions? And this is one example. So that mouse has to define whether it wants the carrot or the cheese. And initially has to select a goal, maybe dependent on its mood, whether it had carrots maybe days before, so now it rather wants to have cheese or whatever. So initially 
an organism needs a kind of goal of what does it want to achieve. Um, so let's assume it's a cheese. And then you have to recruit memory. You have to know maybe where is that cheese from your environment. And maybe you then have to no, oh, yeah, it's in that room with that floor. And this gives you a kind of other goal, a more detailed goal, which you in which you use your kind of memory already. And once you start along to move, you probably have learned in order to reach the room with this kind of floor, you have to make a left turn. So this is how you can structure the task into different cognitive stages. You start with an ultimate goal and most reinforcement learning just say, yeah, cheese left. No? But here we substructure this task, of course, here in a very simple way. But that is the key I would like to propose. No? We say initially, cheese, oh yeah, in that room with a structured floor. Or you could also say uh, west. No? In. And then, if you want to make a decision about your turn, you could say, oh, if I want to go into that floor, I have to make a left, left turn. No? You can make it more and more complex. Um, but that's the idea. So we compared that data to, to uh, real experiments. Um, Again, this was the task from oh, my wording memory. I don't have it on the slide, I guess, from the. Yeah, the reddish task, but it's from that very famous woman. Yeah, she's a little bit older already. Huh? Gabriel. 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 Anne Gabriel. Huh? Yeah. Uh, so she did this task here uh, with rats moving along here. They had an east and west state and you have a uh, um, reward there, milk or sucrose. And um, you had a gait and a tone here now initially, kind of sensory input. And later on, um, she also recorded in the infralimbic cortex. And there they in she indicated that um, it could be a particular site for habitual learning. Um, and we somewhat put in this idea that in addition to this crosstalk in the loop, we have shortcuts between loops. So that input here bypasses the first loop and directly went into the second loop via the infralimbic cortex. And that bypass, we say or propose, is maybe the solution for habitual behavior. So the model could learn this task, you, you uh, have a tone and you either have a reward in the east or in the west and then the red quickly went to the right location once it learned that and also the model could learn the task. And it learns that by um, these cortical striatal weights, if you give a reward one uh, other subset of, of striatal cells become selective and then also tune uh, or um, activate these uh, GPI neurons or rather deactivate here um, and a different subset is deactivated so therefore it um, easily learned to from the goal to the east-west location and then from east-west to right or left turn. Um, so, but when we overtrain the model um, and do a devaluation experiment, I don't know if you're familiar with these, but you take a reward and make it unattractive. You, are, um, you can, for example, com combine it very with a nauseatic dose, so you, that you know, that you don't like that uh, in initial reward anymore. So, and in these conditions. Overtrained animals still tend to go to the location of where the reward is, or they don't, they don't like it anymore. Animals that are not overtrained avoid that. Um, and so did the model. But how did the model do this? Because the EL, this, this connection here, 
is informing the second loop about the relationship where the reward is. And if the EL, that is also a slow learner again, has learned this relationship, it's good for habitual behavior because it's a shortcut. It can bypass many loops, can lower the, all the effort, but has a problem of being then um, being not able to um, yeah, respond um, by avoiding that stimulus. So that is uh, what we propose. It's uh, unpublished work and uh, in review. So I. But Fred, I thought and and Grabiel yeah. is linking is linking habit also to the bracket cells in the stratum. Yeah. And now in your model you bypass them, it seems. Or yeah. Or you have a role for them. Yeah. We we, we didn't see that bracketing behavior, but I think with that because um, our task we modeled uh, we we just modeled the the decision here we didn't. Uh, model the whole walking behavior of, of that uh, okay. rat. Yeah. yeah, but uh, maybe you can skip the summary uh, or conclusion. I think I explained everything. Um, but in summary, uh, I hope these are steps towards uh, kind of brain-like artificial intelligence. It is gr to strongly grounded in, in computational neuroscience, but not just doing data fitting, also showing that actually these models could be used for some useful task. Also, I have to admit the tasks we are presently solving with this are still simple, but we hope that we proceed with it. Very good. Thank you, Fred.